Hey, folks, we're back with a brand spanking new thumbnail and a new title. It's the bi weekly QA now. My God. My the humanity. God. It's good to be back. We're here to answer questions with, I like the sexy new thumbnail. I'm so stoked on that. Scott is the man. Isn't it, though? It's amazing. Yes, I love it. Dr. Mike, how's it going? Everything good with you? It's good. I actually wanted to answer a really quick question someone had that we won't be able to really get to. Someone asked, how do we get, um, can, can they have the music that's in these various training videos? And the answer to that is no, because the music is either written by Scott, our video guy, because he's an audio engineer and a musician. He's, he's, he's fucking amazing. Or, so it's either custom written or sourced from a pay for play library that musicians use in video production to get various soundtracks going. So you can't actually have this publicly because you have to pay for it. Uh, and he does, but it gives you like, he's got this access to these libraries that have like unreal number of tracks. And they're usually not like vocal tracks. They're like mood tracks and there's different 50 different moods. So it's uh, that's where he gets it from. Uh, sorry. I know that's a shitty answer because sometimes I love the music I hear in some videos and I'm like, I want that actual song. And it turns out it's not a song. So, yeah. Just, yes. For, if you guys are familiar with stock images, it's the same idea just with music. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, we got some questions. I do think uh, I did notice that uh, in Milo's um, tagging last times, I couldn't help but laugh. There was the part where he just labeled it as interesting tangent. <laughs> that's when that's awesome. Talking about porn. <laughs> that's great. People love it. There's comments like that was the greatest tangent ever. <laughs> Folks, we're only good for a few things. Sports science and weird tangents. About porn. That's about it. Ooh, there's some shit talking on this one. I'm who said? Uh, Paul oh, said. Uh, <laughs> Lyle doesn't even look like someone who lifts weights. LOL. Burn. Yeah. Incineration. Lyle is D-E-D. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember like uh, a couple years ago? So people were saying LOL. And then they started saying L-E-L because -E like some guy made a typo. And then it was like cool to do that. And then this is really trippy. Some incel fuck uh, like mistyped it as K E K, so it was Keck. And then like for a few months, people were trying to be like Keck Keck Keck, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And like people who really yes. weren't into that subculture were trying to do it. They're like Keck Keck. I'm like, what? What? Shut up! And thankfully they shut up. But it was like painful level of fucking deep dive memeology, alt right internet psychoticism. It's just like. Ugh. Sometimes you don't know too, because like my Spanish speaking friends will say like, yeah, you know, J-A-J-A -J -A is like, ha, 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 ha. And I, I look at that as like, ja, ja, ja or something. I'm yeah. like, what's that? I'm yeah. like, oh, wait, no, it's speaking yeah. another language. It's a ha sound for them. So you can't tell like if it's that or if it's something else or if it's right. like, internet speaking. Right, speed. am I missing the boat here? Or is K-E-K -E -K yeah. the stupidest thing and fucking thing anyone's ever invented? That's what my cat does when he sees a bird. K -K 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 -K. Oh, he makes weird sounds, right? Yeah. It's yeah. crazy that you think like you know what a cat does. You're like, cats meow, and sometimes they hiss and rah, they do that too. And then and then you see them interact with a bird, and you're like, you have an entirely different subcategory of like personality. Like it's oh, yeah. so weird. It's like never, it's like aliens have a human in isolation, and they're like he talks, he's a nice guy, this and that. And then they introduce like a member of the opposite sex he's attracted to, and they're like, What's he doing? He never <laughs> does this. And they're like, Well, he's got this whole other part of him that he doesn't even like. So Yes, my ferocious little killer. He, well, he low could fuck up a bird or two, right? Assuming oh, yeah. he, could jump. he fucks up mice all the time. He actually, yeah, right. he does the thing where he like beats them within like an inch of their life and then toys with them for like hours. I'm like, dude, so then I have to just kill it. I'm like, dude, you're, yeah. you're a horrible animal. Just kill this fucking mouse already. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of killing mice, want to get to the first one? Let's do it. Don't move your screen because you got them right at the bottom. Ali oh. Alamomin. Got it. Ali has got some shit on his mind. Holy cow, he's got a lot of uploads too. Well yep. done, Ali. Very well done. For some reason, it was one of the only ones to get a lot of uploads. It wasn't a joke. Um, all right. He says, hi, docs. I'm having a very difficult time applying many of your autoregulatory concepts that are needed in practice to find volume landmarks. Um, adjust training parameters, sets, reps, frequency, evaluate SFR, and decide when to deload is because I'm very unsure of how different indicators are supposed to actually feel, such as the mind-muscle connection, muscle disruption, muscle pump, systemic fatigue, et cetera. I conceptually understand these indicators. 
after having have read three of your books, the volume recovery and hypertrophy book, God damn, that's a good start. Um, mm-hmm. And watch most of your videos, but I'm still struggling to apply them in most muscles. For example, I couldn't feel any difference after doubling my arms volume beyond the fact that performance continuously drop after each set. Aside from running out of breath, the only fatigue I feel is locally during the set, which immediately disappears after I put down the weight. No pump, uh, burn, or disruption, and the only reliable soreness I get is for quads, hams, calves. Dr. Mike once mentioned that this is normal for beginners, but I don't think this is the case because I've been lifting for around four years. Bench squat deads is 225, 315, 405, respectively, for six to eight reps. Beside the possibility that I'm still a beginner, hopefully, any advice on how to evaluate SFR? and auto-regulate volumes and deloads if I can't properly assess these indicators. Lastly, I want to thank you for truly amazing content. You keep providing free for the community. Between the Q&As, made simple videos and advanced concepts lectures, the number of subscribers and views you get is criminally low. And I, I believe some low. people need to be charged for that. Prosecution. Someone needs to go to YouTube jail. Mm. Mark Zuckerberg, even. He runs yeah. YouTube, right? It's all the same cabal. I refuse to believe that, Gene, that Google and Zuck are on different terms. I feel me. They need to fix my shit because I, I watched like one strongman video lately and now all of my social media is exclusively world's strongest man videos. I'm like, look, I love this, but enough. Come on. Yeah. They're like, oh, this is what you like? Yeah, yeah. all of it. Yeah. <laughs> I had a similar problem where I was telling myself that I was searching for strongman, but I was really searching for S and M and it's all just porn and oh. I like it. So it's good. <laughs> Anyway, I also uh, call social media s and a little social and media. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. That is good. It ends up being... All right, let's, <laughs> the same. let's get to answering Ali's question. So mm-hmm. great question. Good news. You don't need hardly any of these things to do a good job in training. What you need to do is you need to track your performance and everything else is really highly secondary to that. So you just add a rep or add five pounds to the bar every week at any given volume that is just normally within the range you think it would cause hypertrophy just from the literature alone. And our our, uh, Renaissance periodization site has a whole section on every muscle group, rough uh, targets for MEV to MRV are covered. So just just shoot literally the middle of that range, start with three reps in reserve, and then uh, increase the load and or reps over and over and over, week after week after week. When your performance caps and falls, that is unequivocal. You don't need any, you don't need to perceive anything. You should be able to know how to count. And so you hit, you know, 225 for 14 reps on the bench. And then the next week you hit 230 for 12 reps. That's a dec- decrease in performance. If you, the next workout you have later that week, again, all your numbers are down. That's it. It's time for you to deload. And then you can go and construct your next mesocycle. Now, as far as what kind of volumes to choose, because that's really the only question that's really left over is just try to choose volumes that are a little different. So if you had really good results with an average of 10 sets per week per muscle, try an average of six to eight and see how that next meso goes. And you might be like, nah, you know, like I just, the gains just weren't as good. The, the rep strength hasn't increased as much. My pump, like my muscles don't look as big. And then, uh, sorry, or rather they just, it didn't seem to increase much. And then you try another meso where you do like, you know, 12 to 14 sets instead of, uh, instead of roughly 10. And then you're like, you had the greatest uh, you know, growth of your life and your performance is skyrocketing and everything like that. And the next meso, you're the strongest you've ever been, you know, fuck man. I, I feel like you know, that's the, the better answer. At the end of the day, those are the rock solid shits we want to go on anyway, because pump and mind muscle connection and stuff, they're very, very subjective and it's not ultra powerful. Now this entire time that you're doing this for years of just performance oriented tracking and auto-regulation, you need to be aware and just try to sort of sit with the language your body is speaking to you and get a little bit more nuance. It's kind of like, so, so, so basically like, um, you know, you try to assess the pump after various sets and right now it's not working at all. You're like, I don't know. I don't have a pump, but after a few years, you'd be like, okay, like my chest definitely feels a little bit harder after four sets of bench press than after four sets of dumbbell press or like definitely harder after two sets than after three or, or sorry, than after, you know, sorry, harder after like six sets than after three or something like that. So, okay, I feel like I get a better pump from six than from three. That means like I probably shouldn't be stopping at three, right? There's something to get between four or five and six. Mind muscle connection, an easy one is like, do you feel the tension in that muscle versus another muscle? And that's something that's kind of hard to pick up, but you can get better at it. 
So at some point you're like, okay, this tension is definitely like someone's like, how are these cable curls feeling? You're like, but I feel my forearms a lot, but I don't feel my biceps a ton. And they're like, okay, great. Well, so just say it's not the greatest SFR ever because the tension is low to the bicep. Let's try these dumbbell curls. And you try them, you're like, ooh, yeah, just a little bit more on the bicep. That's a start. Just being able to differentiate even the big rocks. So for example, your high bar, deep high rep squats here and single leg BOSU ball squats here. Like you're gonna have to, the quads have to feel a little different. They have to, the pump's gotta be a little different. All the stuff in the middle, you might be not so good at differentiating. It's not a big deal. Just try to listen to the language. It's, it's kind of it's kind of like this. Like if you don't speak Arabic at all, but you have to live in like Beirut for three years, you just like interacting with locals and just listening to what they're saying. Like after every time, most times that a lady gets like, she buys like a thing of nuts or of grapes or something from a shop owner. He says something and she says something. After a while, you're like, I think she's saying thank you. And when you see that there's people like not nice facial expressions and he hands her something and she doesn't say that word or she says something else, you're like, yeah, that word's definitely like thank you. And you ask your friend, he's like, that is thank you. So are you going to learn Arabic like that? Probably not. But are you going to be able to pick up some shit and make some sense of what's going on? Of course, right? So you know, uh, so final word here from me, and then we'll get to James. You don't need a ton of this bullshit. Just try your best to listen to it while using exclusively performance as your auto-regulatory measure. Yeah, excellent answer. And I agree with Dr. Mike here. One thing I would add is that, um, so you've read our books, so you know that we are big fans of using both like pre-planned periodization and fatigue management strategies and auto-regulatory ones. The problem that you are seeming to run into is that you might be leaning too heavily on auto-regulation when you don't have a huge grasp of a lot of some of this baseline stuff yet, which is perfectly fine. So you want to use both in your programming, right? But when you are kind of, and I know you might not be a beginner in terms of your training age, but in terms of your developing a sense for volume landmarks, SFR, those types of things, it sounds like you're a little bit more on the beginner side on the knowledge end, which is totally fine. So in that case, what I would say is you might want to just lean more towards pre-planning and pre-planning is good in the sense that it will allow you to just not have so much noise in the decisions that you make where you might run a, let's just say a block. So you did three mesos and they were, it was all pre-planned by the end of the three, you'll have a pretty good idea of like which exercises were not good choices, which rep ranges were not good choices for certain muscles. Did you deload at the proper time or not? Did you have enough sets? Yes or no? You know, these are things that will work themselves out essentially through a very rigid trial and error. The problem that when uh, you don't really have a feel for like how many sets should I be doing? What's a good SFR rep range for this muscle? And you try to auto-regulate those things. You end up just trying a bunch of shit and making no progress. Where it's like Mike gave the example with the cable curls and you're like, I'm feeling these in my forearms a lot. And so you might be quick to say, let's switch to something else. When the reality is maybe you should stick with that cable curl for a couple mesos and figure out where your groove is on the cable curl before you throw it away and say, this isn't a good variation for me, or this isn't a good SFR movement. And that's the benefit of using the pre-plan where you just say like, I'm going to do like a very reasonable sequence of things, and then I'll reevaluate them at the end. And then as you get a better feel for like, okay, seems like my MEVs and MRVs are, you know, roughly this, it seems like these movements are pretty good, then auto regulation becomes more and more helpful. And so by the time you kind of get to that, like, intermediate stage, you're kind of doing like a little like a 50 50. And then once you get to more advanced stage, like a Dr. Mike, it's looking mostly like auto regulation and less like pre planning. But for beginners, it's going to look more like pre planning with a little bit of auto regulation. And that's how you figure out a lot of this shit out. So it's kind of like just I don't want to say trial by fire, but it is kind of like set a plan, execute it, and then re reevaluate how it went. And that's how you dwindle some of these choices down. Boom. Perfect. Yeah. And just to one say one last quick little thing, a lot of people don't know to be in tune with these things or they're in tune with them improperly. And they're massive ripped guys because they just steadily train with a little bit more load and a few more reps all the time because it's just ego. And they're just like, oh, I need to pull it. Like I'm working, you know, how many times do you see bodybuilder be like, yeah, starting off this off season, I'm doing four plates on the hacks. What I really like to get to like five plates at the end of it. Like my friend, that's it. You just discovered all the training right there. The quads grew right there. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, you can't go from four plates to five plates when they're that big already without you some more growth. And if you cheat your technique, James, well, and pretend that you did five. <laughs> you know that that's not even an option for us. We talked about this last time. That's right. That's right. Stick like on that. Some people will like post like hack squat PR and you look at it like you think you're hack squatting, but you're not. Yeah. What are you doing? Anyway. All right. All right. Uh, oh, hey, funny enough. This is really mean, but I, I won't say who this is. I, I don't think I know who this is, but there's uh, some folks training at uh, the gym I train at. 
and they were using they're like 250 pound guys but like pretty high level of body fat and just like strong dudes and this they, they were using big um, beefy men yeah they were using leg press one of the greatest leg presses ever assembled actually and they were using like very partial ROM and they were doing like 10 plates on a side and then like plates on top and all this stuff. And I literally would just record a video. It'll be out in a few months, probably a few weeks um, with uh, Brianni Terry, who's one of the top three 165 pound female power lifters of all time. And she squats like for sure to depth more than these guys, like fucking for a fact, right? She was doing in our video, 275 pounds total, including the fucking leg press like with proper technique it's just kind of like and her quads are just objectively bigger than theirs it's just kind of like 10 plates versus two plates and a quarter like you don't Do you, think this is weird you don't think something's <laughs> a little off that's what always kills me right where i'm like i get that there's ego involved but also like you're looking around the room get a feel for you know i don't know it just seems stupid like if that was me and i look over and you know i see somebody else doing full rom and they have bigger legs than me with way less weight i'd be like hmm I had a moment like that when uh, this one kid who was an Olympic weightlifter at the University of Michigan, I was 19 and I was half squatting because I just didn't know any better. And uh, I watched him do pretty lightweight squats, two plates on, on each side, but he sunk into like uh, absurd, obnoxious weightlifter depth where I swear to God, his asshole touched the ground <laughs> right. and his quads were like big, bigger than mine. And I was like, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. I'm going to tell no one about this. I'm just instantly going to start squatting all the way down. <laughs> so I don't feel pathetic anymore. I don't like feeling like this. And then I started squatting lower and I was like, oh, okay, great. Now and then I'll then. So anyway. Yeah. Um, all right. Next up is strength hacks coaching. What the fuck? Get a regular oh. hacker on our hands. There he is. Hacks or got it. Beep, boop, beep, boop, boop. Computers, numbers, input, output. He asks, uh, what are your favorite primary movements for each muscle group to maximize so far? Well, some of them are included in our muscle hypertrophy guides on the Renaissance periodization website. Um, first answer. Second of all, a uh, huge caveat to anything James and I will share after this. James and I will give like two or three muscle groups. We're not going to go through all of them. It's kind of insane. There's like 14 or some shit like that. Uh, we'll just give like an exercise or two for some of the ones we, we really like. Think you should maybe try. We can do quick hitter. You name one and we'll be like, Mike, one, two, James, one, two, next. Quick yeah. hit. I'm like, back. You're like, oh, I don't know what he actually says. Uh, uh, back. Uh, uh, the so lateral raise. Questions. Shit. Lateral raise. <laughs> Did I get it wrong? Like, yeah, you actually got your own question wrong. Um, so, dude, I should write like a spoof article, like biomechanics bullshit. Like why the lateral raise is the best back movement you'll ever do. People <laughs> would be like, Dr. Mike said. Dude, they literally, uh, I'm sure some people would be like, see, told you. Um, so the huge caveat to anything James and I share is this. And this is, I'm going to try to say this in the nicest way possible. It fucking does not matter because I used to be a big believer that some movements were objectively better than others. Uh, like as far as like black and white. Now I think at the extreme end, some movements are for sure shit for most people, not all. And at the other end, some movements are really fucking good for most people and not all like high bar squat versus BOSU ball squat. Like, look, you someone on this earth actually legitimately gets a better quad workout with BOSU ball squats than high bar squat. I, I don't actually doubt that, but that person is one out of a billion or some shit like that. So when we share with you a couple of exercises that work for us, we want you to really, really contextualize. This comes not just from us, but from everyone that trains. Some, the movement is always and everywhere personal. SFR is your own individual variable you calculate and it is king. It's like, I will never in a million years, like when I program for people, like I program for Charlie, uh, Charlie says, hey, like on this machine bench, I actually get a better workout than I do on dumbbell press. Now, I like dumbbell presses better than machine bench, but if he says, he, and he knows his volume landmarks and he knows his perceptive indicators really well, he knows what tension is in the muscle, he knows what joint pain is, he's like, I get a better pump, better stretch, better tension, and very little joint pain compared to a regular dumbbell press. I'm never going to tell Charlie, no, dumbbell press is better because it's free weight. What the fuck? He's like, clearly, it's working better for him to do this other thing. So it's all down to you and individually. Now, I'll start with saying that I really like the barbell, heavy, compound, high range of motion, basic movements almost everything. So you want big shoulders, you do barbell upright rows. You want big biceps, you do barbell curls all the way up and down. Uh, high bar squats, stiff legged deadlifts, good mornings, barbell rows from a deficit, barbell bench, barbell incline. If those movements are in and you do respond well to them, you're going to get a lot out of them. They've dealt my body a huge, uh, amazing hand of muscle over the years, and I'm in love with them. But I also know that a lot of people don't fucking like them. So it's caveat a big time, but that's just what I like. 
please do not assume that that's going to, what's going to be getting you your best SFRs. James, what do you think? Yeah. So I think like, you know, when we give recommendations for SFRs, again, as Mike said, that's kind of like an aggregate recommendation of like more often than not, these are probably pretty good choices, but again, it always comes down to you. Like for me, like I'm like a weird mixed bag of like um, some things, uh, really big range of motions, really great for me. So like um, cambered bar bench press is really good, like deep as fuck dumbbell chest flies, really good. Um, knee extension and sissy squat bench thing. I don't know what you call it. Sissy squat stand. Uh, oddly good for me. Normally we would say like, you should probably think about leg press or squats. I just end up using a bunch of my other synergistic muscles on those. And for whatever reason, these are just better for me on the quads. It's just me. Um, other things like, uh, cable curls, cable triceps work really good for me. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, 45 degree back raise. It's like legendary for me. For your hamstrings. Know. Yeah. For hamstrings. Um, that's all I can really think. Oh, uh, cable, cable, straight arm lat pulls. Really good. Like would, would I, if I was programming for someone, would that be the first thing I would program for back? Absolutely not. Um, I would probably start with some kind of pull down or pull up or a row variation. But for me, cause I'm stretch arm strong over here, uh, just, and I also am heavy. So I suck at pull ups. <laughs> Those work really good. <laughs> but again, these are all just like individual things. Like would I necessarily program for people that way? Not unless they indicated that this is a good movement for them. Yeah. Very cool. So that, there it is. Um, just do like Toucan Sam does. Follow your nose. Oh, uh, wherever it goes to the flavors of fruit. He's a, he seems to be one of the serial characters that doesn't immediately scream psychopath. Um, a lot of them, Dougie and I were talking about this. A lot of the serial characters are literally like drug addicts. Like, oh, yeah. They're like cuckoo for Cocoa Crisp or whatever. That guy uh, was on meth. Dude, they're like wigging out and they need their fix. It's terrible. Did you saw the Rick and Morty oh, yeah. edition of, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lucky Lucky Charms, like, cut the fucking you know, Lucky Charms out of the guy's <laughs> stomach. Um, all right. Here we go. Nog Heads. N O G H E A D Z. Nog Heads. Let's see. That sounds like one of those like there fat heads or whatever, those little bobblehead things that you can get. Oh, yeah. By the way, I saw a lot of people mentioning that Chainsaw Man is getting an anime, so I'm very excited. Thanks for, for tuning me in on that. It's awesome. I'm super stoked. Fucking nerds. All right. Mm -hmm. Hey, Docs. I'm using the RP male physique template, but I have one question about progression that I can't seem to find an answer. I understand that each week I will try to beat the reps from the week before. Match or beat... Uh, or match or beat the reps um, from the week before if the weight has increased. However, what's not clear to me is what my target reps... Should be for the second exercise for the same muscle group if I've increased the number of sets in the first exercise for that muscle group. It seems increased fatigue for the first exercise make it difficult to match the second rep exercise from the week before. Please help. So, hey, check this out. Really good answer for you. Um, if you're going to make rep jumps for RIR, make smaller rep jumps for that second exercise. So you for the first, you might add two reps every week for a while. For the, for the second one, maybe just one, maybe zero. So, so I put it this way. If you did five sets of leg presses and then you did some certain performance in squats afterwards, the next week you did six sets of leg press, just time that first performance is an equivalent of a relative overload, uh, a relative progression because you tied it under a higher fatigue locally circumstance. So it's actually a bigger stimulus, right? So sometimes just hanging in there is good enough. So for example, if I'm doing, let's say a, a bunch of bench presses first, and then a bunch of uh, wide grip dips after for chest, I might progress on bench press from 225 to 250 over the course of four or five week mesocycle, matching reps the entire time. For dips, I might start with 15 dips on a first set at body weight and end at 15 dips at body weight on the first set at the end of the thing. You'd be like, oh my God, you didn't get stronger at all. Uh -huh -uh. But I'm benching 250 for six sets now before, and I was benching 225 for three sets. Now, sometimes you won't be able to keep up when you'll actually hit failure and, and, and start to your reps will start to drop. Does that mean you hit MRV? No. MRV is only and ever assessed by the first exercise in that muscle group for that session. That's how you tell your performance is. Everything else after is residual fatigue. Is it okay to go to failure on all the other exercises after? Yeah, for sure. It's not a big deal, especially for like one or two weeks towards the end of the meso. No big deal. Just grind it out. Try to get your performance. Uh, no, uh, no, nobody lost, nobody found. But that's another really good emphasis for um, the idea that 
even your second exercise should really start at three or four RIR in that first week. Because like, if you're like, yeah, the first exercise I go three or four RIR, then I feel warmed up. I go close to failure on the second one. Like, mm-hmm. you will be going really to failure and then beyond failure if you're trying to match performance later in the meso. So th- that's a, kind of the best tips to go about that. But you're absolutely right in recognizing you're not going to make the same jumps of performance or maybe any at all over the course of the meso for the second and sometimes even third exercise. And that's just the way love goes. I'm glad you brought up that point there at the end. Typically what I find is when people are having that problem is because they're training too hard, too high of a God damn it. They're training too hard. Their RIR is not scaled accordingly for the subsequent exercises. They're going too hard. Also consider too, right? So it's feasible that you would be biasing. It's, it's feasible that you would pick the first exercise as like your highest SFR for that particular session. And you would bias more of your, your volume progressions and whatnot to that particular exercise. And so you can expect that anything downstream of that is going to get, be getting the tail end. So as Mike said, any of those secondary tertiary or anything after that, sometimes just a, a strategy of just matching what you did is perfectly fine because you might be adding multiple sets to the first exercise or more weight on the bar simply because you're biasing more of your volume to that particular movement because it's better for you. Um, so in that case, you might not see the same aggressive progressions in the subsequent exercises, especially if they're ones where you typically don't make big jumps in weight or big jumps in sets anyway. So it would, if you're like, if we're using the example of bench and then dips, you might be doing, you know, in weeks three and four or five, if you go up that high, something pretty similar to what you did in week one in terms of sets and the weights that you're using. But you actually saw a huge increase in weight and or sets on the first on the bench pressing movement because it's the one that's giving you the biggest stimulus. So in that case, it's okay to just match. And frankly, I would say it's even if you're not matching, like if you're a couple reps off here or there, if you're still hitting your major indicators of like pumped mind muscle connection and soreness on those things, I think you can make a case that says like a couple of reps here or there probably doesn't matter as long as you're still getting those ghetto MEV type indicators in that in those exercises. So that's the thing with hypertrophy. It's just more forgiving than a lot of other training methods like power, strength, all those things are, are ruthless when it comes to hitting your intensity thresholds. But hypertrophy training, a couple of reps here or there, is if you're if you're getting a good pump, you feel it and you're sore from it, like you're probably fine. Next up, Vasil Jeleev. Got it. With the RP logo, Vasil. I like that. <laughs> uh, um, Vasil's opinion does not represent those of Renaissance periodization or its affiliates. Uh, hey, docs, I keep getting these muscle slash nerve spasms when training. Bake. Bake. Technique and exercise execution <clears throat> are safe. Cable rows mainly. It manifests when I do the top hold, which has been non negotiable as of late because I have mind muscle connection problems when training back. Pause. You can get a big ass back with no mind muscle connection at all. Dude. Pro bodybuilders do it all the time. It's a heave whole weights around like fucking morons and they have the biggest backs in the world. So and I, I so, think that's a total value that shit. Too. Like the cable row, like you again, it, people are different, but Dr. Mike and I seem to be in agreement on this one. And we have vastly different anthropometry. Like cable rows are sometimes really hard to get right without doing like a peak contraction or like an exaggerated yeah. mind muscle protocol. So yeah. that might be at play here too. Yeah. And it makes me almost freeze slash snap when it occurs. It's like my back is short circuiting from the stimulus. Any ideas? Don't unfortunately, I feel none, none. Say what? Just don't do that shit. Do something else. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> none at all. The thing is, is like when you, if you're going to seek, so, so the only way to really resolve this is to talk to a, a person who's a professional, um, a physical therapist or a sports medicine, musculoskeletal professional, uh, probably a medical doctor. And, uh, and the diagnostic processes, uh, unfortunately, I have quite, quite a lot of contact with sports medicine. It's just not at a level of advancement we would like to have for bodybuilding and powerlifting, where uh, you'll say like, oh, like, the number one thing, I guarantee you, when you say, hey, I have this weird spasm when I do this movement, they're like, okay, is it getting away with your life? And they're like, no. Other, what about other exercises? Can you do them? And you're like, yeah. And they're like, we just don't do it. That's the first thing you're going to tell you. And if you want to increase this sort of a diagnostic magnitude, they're going to like do some stuff where they um, they might do some imaging or they might press on some pain centers and, and pressure points and stuff and see if what's going on. Does it probably have some candidate nerves that might be getting impinged? And that's probably what's happening. Like when you arch and retract, you're, you're like sort of crushing some nerve in there, not crushing, just impinging on it. And it fires off and it fucking spazzes the shit out of your back. And a lot of times that the human body's designed in an interesting and imperfect way. And 
sometimes your muscles get bigger or some other muscle gets bigger or the body moves around or way it's going to stop happening. Like for a while, like I'll go through phases where I have like my elbow, uh, I'll have like the ulnar nerve do this like blast during tricep extensions. Ooh. You ever have that James where it's like, yes. you, your pinky hurts and you're like, ah, <laughs> it feels like electricity going through yes. your shit. And, and then sometimes it just doesn't, uh, and it just goes for years without doing it. And then some, some months it just starts doing it. So I would say just stay away from that exercise, do other ones, and then slowly come back to it a few months later and see if it's okay. Uh, yes, uh, you can go the sports medicine route and try to figure out what the problem is. Unfortunately, it's very likely going to be a laborious and probably fruitless endeavor, James. Yeah, I agree. I also think like, you know, using comparable exercises is another good way of troubleshooting this one. Like, can you do bent over rows or like one arm dumbbell rows? And like, those don't have the same problem. No. Okay. Well then it's probably something you're doing on this, this movement explicitly or the way that it's loaded to me. Like if you can do pull downs and, and bent over rows and two arm dumbbell, row, if you can do similar movements and you don't have any problems with those, it's just this one, all signs point to like either the movement or the technique that you're using within the movement that, that would, that would be how I would look at that. But again, I think the simple answer is like, if you're getting weird spasms, just pick something else, find another movement, especially, I don't know. Has your opinion changed on this since we've talked about this, Dr. Mike? I always found cable rows to be like, okay, but you need to do like 10 sets of them to get like anything going. Raw stimulus magnitude is just straight garbage for me. Yeah. And other people swear by them, but like if I do them heavy bodybuilder swinging style, the mind muscle connection doesn't exist. And I'm like, I could do 10 sets of this and I would just get really tired. And yeah. if I do them with a really good peak attraction, a really good technique, I can do test sets. I'm not very tired and I have a slight pump and a slight degree of like, oh, I'm getting a stimulus in my back. But I'm like, why am I doing? I can do three sets of barbell bent rows and be like, I'm done for the day. That's all the back work I need. Or I can sit on the fucking cable row for 10 sets. So sometimes shit is just like, uh, it's just the way love goes, you know? Again, yeah, I yeah. It twice. It's odd when like you and I have similar SFR issues with one movement because usually we we're, we're tend to be a little bit like polar opposites just because we're built differently, you know? So it's interesting when that happens. Yeah, it's really trippy too when you see um, you uh, you get like uh, you know multiple people saying that the same exercise sucks, but then you see like some people getting on the fucking cable row and doing like the mid range of motion just like this with that little oh, yeah. dildo handle. Oh yeah, and I'm just like, can you describe to me what you think is happening there? And a lot of times, like I said uh, earlier to the gentleman that I uh, Leo known asked you know how important is this mind muscle connection stuff. And that guy's probably really big, you know. <laughs> yeah. Again, there's no way. Like we've we had we've trained with plenty of people now in RP, and I've tra I've trained a whole bunch. Uh, James has off camera, but we got plenty of people in the training videos who look at us dumbfounded after we teach them how to do an exercise and do a couple of hard working sets. They're like, I didn't even know I had muscles in that area. And they're like, Oh well, yeah, like shit happens, you know, when you do shit right. But a lot of people don't, and they still get really good results, just not the best results. So the you know. Uh, cable rows, you know, yeah, you could make them work and a lot of people love them, but a lot of people just kind of do them and they still do something. I just, to me, it's just a giant waste of time. In those cases. Yeah. This is the prime example of like when you're doing movement training versus muscle training, like, well, this is a, a movement that you can do, but is it training your yeah. muscles? Like, hundred right. percent. Hmm. All right. Next up is you're going to have to search for this, James. Oh, fuck. Daisho Otoko, who better be Japanese. Because if he's not, uh, you you just got elected to King Weeb. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. James, remember that text I sent you? That yes. fucking meme. I so love like, that. The, uh, would you, what's the, is there a name for that? Because it's not hentai. There's a more specific name, right? For what that shit is. Well, hentai is like porn. They, usually they call that like waifu kind of stuff. Or it's waifu. Like, yeah. So it's like, it, so here's the thing. That stuff's all good and well. And I don't have a problem. <laughs> the whole the following is just a joke. Everyone's like, James knows too much about this shit. Right. But yes, like what, what trips me out, again, this is just a joke, is like when people use these fucking waifu fucking little memes to make like serious points or insert them into actual conversation. Like I remember like during the Trump election time, they like turned these waifu things into like MAGA things where it was like a girl like tank on a tank and she's yeah. like, oh my God, Trump. And you're like, can you explain to me how this relates to geopolitics? And they're like, well, you see, let's go. You jack off the big Japanese titties in your face and you love that shit. Just say it. They're like, well, yeah. But like, why do you have to mix jacking off in politics? It doesn't make any goddamn sense to me. It's, like, yeah. it's just a joke. Stay calm. And so, I'm with you. so even for me, it's sometimes they're like, they go way over my head. 
I don't even get like the Pepe Frog ones. I'm like, look at, I'm like, what's the joke? Right. I don't get it. Yeah. I'm like, at least Pepe, like for sure, only stands for one thing, which is like alt right, speak truth to power, say politically incorrect shit. Fine. Okay, but like the waifu stuff is designed to be like shit you look at and you're like, yeah, you fuck sluts. But then like it's like Donald Trump. You're like, I don't want to think about Donald Trump when I'm looking yeah, at Chinese uh, titties uh. and fuck out of my face. I may very well not ever want to think about Donald Trump, as a matter of fact. Next, they're going to be making these shits for Joe Biden, and I'm really going to get this. He's, Donald Trump's still calling my house pretty regularly. That's awesome. I never get any calls from him. Yeah. So My parents are, are one of the top donors to the Trump campaign in the like, state of Michigan. They're How are you not time. getting phone calls? He calls me like twice a day. Hey James, it's Donnie. I'm back. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be back in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> fuck. Uh, if you guys are looking at my screen share here, there is a, a. I can't take my eyes off this guy with the bench press situation. This uh, 34 workout fails. You don't want to repeat. Look at this guy. Oh boy. Holy fuck. That man is in a bad place. That is not where you want to be. Yikes. <laughs> All right, let's hit this. Uh, let's hit this potentially nice Japanese guy. I know. I was like, I was, was like, thanks for going into waifu just from seeing my name. Yeah, there's like a real Japanese culture, and there's like Japanese exports white people are into. Well, actually, and <laughs> black people. Some of the most dedicated fucking weebs are like the the occasional black weeb is like usually real hardcore into the shit. Paul Canoe, we're talking about you. God damn it! Somebody tag Paul in this. Yes. Um. Especially uh, like Naruto. Yeah, yeah. Our friend uh, Paul is a IFB professional bodybuilder. He's a phenomenal guy, just all around great guy. And he's he's black. He's actually African. And he, James, I got to tag you in some of the shit I might have. He does like a review of his favorite animes on Instagram. Oh, sweet. I should this see motherfucker it. writes like a 10 page paper on each one. And it's like ratings and sub ratings. It's like, God damn, Paul. Holy shit. Like he doesn't. Wait, I actually think I might know who you're talking about. He doesn't simply watch anime. He absorbs it. It's intense. He does videos, right? uh, Does he do videos? I think he for sure does posts. He might do videos. I think an ultra jacked black dude. Um, Okay. Maybe a different guy then. Yeah. Yeah. But like, oh, there's no shortage of people doing anime review videos. I'll tell you that. But like, it's just, it's just, it's just funny to me, like how in depth and it was no, no saying we all like our shit. But like I was like, God damn, because he watches the same shit you do, James, of like the most obscure fucking anime ever. And it was like some of these ones, it's just like a story of a kid in high school and there's no action. There's no like real plot. It's just like a kid in high school. And Paul's like, I really love the character development. I'm like, what? There's like anyway. certain genres like that. I watched the one that was I just like picked a shot in the dark one last night. I, like it almost brought me to tears. It, I, don't, I don't I don't remember what it was called, but it was basically like this omniscient being is like sent to Earth. It uh, like mimics things so it like mimicked being a rock for a while and then it mimicked like being moss and then it encountered a wolf and like the wolf dies in front of it so then it like it 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 mimics being a wolf and it experiences consciousness for the first time and it finds this guy and they live in fucking like norway or whatever long story short the guy like the wolf is like the guy's only friend and the guy like goes to find his family who left and he finds like their caravan they're all dead he like gets into an accident he dies he like tells like this omniscient alien being who's a wolf he's like remember me because you were like my only friend he dies that's like the end of the episode i was like this is awful what the fuck but as charlie tells me it makes you feel feelings it did it did i was like god damn this isn't what i thought this was gonna be i thought this was like sci-fi shit there you go yeah all right (laughs) sorry milo milo good luck labeling this answer um Hey, doctors. Dr. James, I happen to have a build more similar to you, 195 centimeters tall, 200 centimeter wingspan, fluctuate between 90 and 100 kilograms. Do you have any specific recommendations for growing arms and pull-ups, or should I stick to specialization cycles? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a a, a tough one. So pull-ups is one, like, for, I think, for tall, lanky people, especially if you're on the heavy side. Like, I, you know, I'm fairly muscular, so I have a lot of weight as well. And pull-ups are just one, like I have never made a ton of progress. I've always been kind of shitty at it. Whereas things like pull downs is something that I can make tangible, noticeable improvements just because of either the biomechanical differences or that I just don't have to lug my big old body around. So what I have found for me, uh, for um, any of the back stuff, I started using more back isolation in the form of either dumbbell or cable straight arm pulls. And sometimes I'll use those as either a pre-exhaust or as their own thing. Or sometimes I've even done metabolite training on that. 
And then a combination of like, for me, like underhand close grip type pull downs tends to work really well and tends to be really responsive for arms. The specialization phases have been key for me. And one of the things I've gotten away from was doing a lot of like just standing straight up barbell curls because I tend to sway a lot just as a result of it having to travel a really long distance. And I tend to get like a lot of shoulder synergy. So I have used a lot more like isolation type things like um, incline curls, spider type curls, like a chest supported kind of like position curl. All of those are kind of like spider curls, more or less. Um, those types of things have been really helpful in increasing the SFR of training my biceps. Whereas like just doing barbell curls or easy curls, like I get a little bit of bicep, but I get a lot of just other stuff too. And it just never really feels all that great. Like I could do sets of curls with like 105 if I wanted to, but then all that ends up happening is that my wrists and elbows get fucked up after a while. And then I don't, my arms don't grow that much more. Um, other ones for like triceps have typically been like, um, like high emphasis on my muscle connection and eccentric accentuation on cable triceps pushdowns. That's always been a really good one for me. Um, JM presses are really good, but there's like a risk reward on that one. They tend to really irritate my elbows as well. What other ones have been really good? The specialization phases have definitely been necessary. And I think ultimately, like you kind of have to break the mold on a lot of the aggregate kind of SFR choices. Like if you say like, okay, pull-ups for back, like that's just, and, and arms, that's just not going to work for you. You just got to have to find and mess around with some different variations. I do a bunch of weird shit that I would never like have my clients do. Like this morning I did um, cable straight arm, uh, cable straight arm lat, you know, things for like sets of, you know, five to 10. I did those as pre-exhaust. And then I did close grip underhand pull downs for a few more sets. And then I did some like chest supported rows. And then I did um, easy curls, easy bar spider curls for like three or four sets. And then I did cable curls for mile reps after that. And would I ask other people to do it that way? No, it's just one of the few things that seems to really get me going, whereas other things kind of don't. So I think think outside the box in terms of your high SFR choices and don't be afraid to try weird shit. Boom. Well, looks like gains are incoming, hopefully. Yeah. Specialization definitely. I mean, like I did, I haven't really amassed a whole lot just because I'm pretty happy with my weight and size currently. But when I have done specialization phases, I mean, like I have the, the blessing of being, you know, like half type, 2A half type one. So it basically means I train arms every day on a specialization phase, which, you know, is cool, but it also sucks. Yeah. All right. Next up is WTF is that cream? All one word, James. <laughs> I think I remember, That's I remember like this way one. down the list there. Yep. Got it. All right. So. Oh boy. Oh For boy. someone who was born with bad calf genetics and didn't have naturally big calves, like some people seem to have me, that was me. What would your long-term Still approach me. to be to build an impressive set of calves in terms of program and exercise selection? Do you think it's doable? And so would be the realistic goals in terms of time required to achieve a meaningful increase in size and slash how much bigger could they get? So I'll answer this kind of in reverse. How much bigger can they get? You'll never know until you try um, because that is uh, something that you know, so your ability, your adaptive ability and your ceiling are actually genetically a little bit different than your initial muscle size. So some people have pretty impressive initial calves. They don't grow all that much. And some people have like pretty small initial calves, myself. And then when they started training them, especially when they did it right, the calves are slowly but steadily grew over time. To answer that um, middle part of your question, how, how much um, time would be realistic to get a meaningful increase in size? I think if you're doing the right thing, and especially if you're gaining weight most of the time, if your calves aren't bigger in about a year, Notably, then like, yeah, yeah, you got to get have it really rough. Um, I think they still grow for almost everyone, but it just might be like, if you can't tell a difference in really hammering them for a year, either you fucked up somehow, which you shouldn't, uh, or you just really not in the cards for you to get much bigger calves. Um, and lastly, how do you do it? Well, you just go Renaissance periodization and there is a muscle group guide for calves and it tells you absolutely everything you need to know to get a really good program together. Frequency, volume, load, progression, exercise, videos, selection tips, myo rep stuff, all of it. So just go ahead and uh, get into that. And um, that should give you all the answers, James. 
Yeah, definitely agree. And Cavs is just one of those, like, it's kind of either you got it in you or you don't sometimes. I actually have a client right now who did a lower body emphasis mass phase and like a special, and I, I, I made a big effort to include a lot of calf work in there because they, their quads and butt and like posterior chain muscles just are massively responsive. Like every time we do a mass phase, it's like, boom. So you got the front end and the back end really coming out and then just like signpost calves. Yeah. Right. Sucks. And it's, it sucks. And so I was like, this time we're going to do like, you know, four, a four uh, meso long mass we're going to do a, a big calf emphasis and guess what happened? Legs kept growing, calves did not. So it just increases the ridiculousness of this person, uh, unfortunately, and uh, they're a good sport. Um, but yeah, sometimes you just have to do those like specialization type things or they're just not, it's just not going to happen. And that might be one where you don't do like a, obviously a, a calf specialization is probably not an economical use of time and calories. But if you are doing a specialization phase, you might consider adding calves as one of the the targeted muscles. And at that point, you're pretty much going to be doing a calf variation virtually every day because your calves can really take a a pretty good beating in terms of volume and frequency. Yep. 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 Furious Dan, who in my view is right below oh, yours as well. Very good. Oh yeah. Oh, he's got a, a little, little anime action going on there too. James, this is one right up your alley. So I'll just let you take this one. How important is sleep schedule consistency with regard to recovery? That is assuming an equal amount of sleep approximately eight hours. Are shift workers with chaotic sleep schedules leaving games on the table and compared to someone who regularly sleeps at about the same time every day? Yes. And James will explain why. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's one of those where the reason why having that schedule is very important is because it affects your circadian rhythms, which affects, you know, a whole lot of different things like your nervous system activity, endocrine activity, just energy levels and stuff throughout the day. When you have variation in your sleep schedule, it's often very difficult for people to fall asleep and or stay asleep or wake up at different times that, you know, or when there's variability, it's hard for them to wake up, sleep and fall asleep at the, at the different times that wouldn't be normal. So although you might be getting rough, you might be giving yourself the same eight hours of sleep opportunity, you might not actually be getting that eight hours of sleep because you're just sitting there for an hour before you can fall asleep or the quality of that sleep might not be good, or you might be waking up at a time that is not optimal for yourself as a result of changing your schedule around. So I don't want to say it's one of the most important things, but I can say that when, when, we, when we are working on getting a, a sleep with people who say like, oh, I only sleep four hours a night or this or that, setting a, setting a consistent wake up time is usually like the first step. I will take with somebody who is doing something fucked up with their sleep. Say, just wake up at the same time and let's work on getting you at least a sleep opportunity of eight hours. Maybe it doesn't work out that way. That's okay. But let's wake up at the same time every day. And then once that becomes routine, then it becomes, you know, again, try and give yourself that, that sleep opportunity of roughly eight hours. And then formally it becomes, okay, you have a bedtime now and let's work on hitting the bedtime at the same time getting that opportunity, waking up at the same time. And that's really when you get people into a good groove on the sleep hygiene. So I do think that you're leaving something on the table. Is it like, uh, what's the magnitude of that effect? I'm not sure, but I think it would be, it would be, a, I would say a tangible effect over time. Like if you're someone who is, has a very variable schedule, uh, you're probably not going to make as, as good of gains over time as someone with a more consistent schedule. Um. Excellent answer, James. Thank you so much. And also just, just to clarify something, we're not clarified, just to add a little bit of insight there, guys, the reason that you start with setting a bed, uh, a wake up time is because if you set a bedtime and you can't fall asleep, you just twiddle your thumbs, you end up sleeping in late and that sleeping in late affects your ability to fall asleep next night. But if you fit, get yourself a wake up time, every morning you wake up at 8am. If you can't st sleep until 1am the night before, you have to wake up at 8am and then you'll be so tired towards the end of the day, you'll probably fall asleep at 10 and 8 will be no problem. So that wake up day, and it sucks. It's not news anyone ever wants to hear. Like waking up blows. It's the worst part of the day, I think. But um, you just got to standardize it if you want to really fix your sleep. Yeah. And if you can't, then just do your best. And then, then it becomes an issue of like, you can do other things for your sleep hygiene. And if you're giving yourself the proper opportunities for sleep, then you're, you're most of the way there at that point. Yep. All right. Henrik Anderson. Ooh. Got oh, it. he's right there. That's really convenient for you. Yeah. Uh, let's say I did an excruciating leg workout. At the end of the workout, I'll do bicep curls. If I were completely refresh, no systemic or local fatigue, I did 27 reps with 50 kilograms. However, due to systemic fatigue, I have to go 40 kilograms, which is way above my 30 RM, to be in the 20 to 30 range. 
since I'm not in the hypertrophy range, 5 to 30 RM, will this not cause any hypertrophy? That absolutely will cause hypertrophy. But so, so you know, 35 reps cause hypertrophy, 40 reps causes it, 45, and so does 50. The thing is they start to fall off after the 30 to 35 range. So that 5 to 30 is like a guaranteed you're getting your best results range. You, know, you get hypertrophy from sets of one to fall, one to four, and you get hypertrophy all the way up to sets of sixty. Absolutely, especially if you're not super advanced, that shit works. It's just not optimal, right? So, are you getting hypertrophy? Almost certainly. Are you getting less than if you did the bicep curls fresh? You are, absolutely are. There's no really way around that because you're going to be you're pretty tired, um, which is why training excruciating legs and then doing biceps after is questionable. So like you, you might be somebody who can train biceps maybe four times a week. And so as long as that's not like your, your bicep, big bicep day, probably not a huge deal, right? You're just getting a light, lighter training day in there. And then on another day, you might hit it harder, but yeah, if there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. It's you're still going to make some, some progress is often better than no progress. Right. So. Yep. And he says on a related note, if I were to do eight sets for a muscle group below per session MAV and due to local fatigue, my strength drop off is very high. I was curling 50 kilograms fresh, but later in the workout, I'm curling 35 kilograms. Isn't 35 too light to cause hypertrophy? Or does the 30 arm rule only apply on the current state the muscle is in? No, it, it applies fresh, uh, but it's just a flexible rule. So even up to 40 or 45 RM, it starts to, it, you know, you still get hypertrophy, just not as much. It's just not as, as effective. So like, uh, here's an example. If you do uh, hack squats, then you do squats, then you do leg presses, then you do lunges, and then you decide to do leg extensions. And by then, you're doing, you know, sets in the leg extension that are like really your 60 RM or something. Are leg extensions growing you that much? Assuming you even have any, you know, well, you said below per session MED, but assuming you have MED left over, not really, man, because you're just so tired. You can't even activate hardly any motor units because that really is what's happening. Like when you're that weak, it means you're a lot of motor units aren't even really turning on anymore because, you know, if you, they did turn on, they'd ostensibly produce at least a decent amount of force and get you to those higher RM values. But if you're so weak that you're way outside of 30 RM, um, and man, it's just time to call it quits. So, you know, eight sets per muscle group. Uh, and if your strength, uh, you know, drop off is, is really, really high, uh, then, you know, as the strength drop off continues, each set gets progressively less and less effective at stimulating hypertrophy. So like, you know, if you started sets of 20 in the squat and then you squat it until you're doing sets of four with the same weight, every additional set of four isn't really causing much more muscle growth. Maybe a little bit, but just not much. So that's why we have a huge emphasis in all these discussions on quality, getting it in and, and, and frequency too. This is where frequency helps. You guys see all these bodybuilders training with 20 sets per muscle group once a week. The high, high quality are those remaining 10 sets after the first 10. Not, I mean, they still help, but they're not that comparable. Whereas if you split it into Monday, Thursday, you know, 10 and 10, man, you actually do get a better performance both times and marginally more muscle growth. So there are very few absolutes here, but yeah, marginally you will absolutely grow more muscle if you are more fresh and less muscle if you're pretty beat up. So I have a similar situation with my training where I often train uh, delts after legs, but one of the things you have to do is make a conscious trade-off and say, like, I, I'm going to try and pick exercises, which are still high in SFR, but maybe don't have as much emphasis on like a really big absolute load. So would I grow my delts probably best if I was doing like heavy presses or heavy upright rows? Sure. Am I going to be able to do that after doing my leg workout? No, for the exact reasons why you're already saying the systemic fatigue spillover is pretty high. What is the effect of doing squats or good mornings on like an incline dumbbell curl, Right. Well, you're probably only using like 15 pounds anyway. Are you going to go, is, how much is the drop-off going to be? Probably not a much at that point. So what you can often find is um, high SFR movements that don't necessarily emphasize a high absolute load. And what you find is that those don't have quite as much performance drop-off in many cases. So that might be a good alternative. So instead of saying, all right, I'm doing barbell curls with, or easy curls with 40 kilograms, maybe I will do, you know, like a concentration curl or a spider curl. And you might find that there's really no drop-off or very little from what you would normally do. And then you have to suffer that penalty much less than something that is more demanding, like a barbell curl or, you know, pick your, pick your exercise. But I think you get the idea. Another great example that James is uh, in a lot of the training that we do, we'll do a, like leg curls or something before we do quad movements and people would be like, shouldn't you do compounds first? And it's like, yeah, the thing is like after leg curls, I'm really warmed up and ready to do quads and are not limiting me. But after a hard session of quads, the systemic fatigue, that precludes any valuable work from doing on leg curls. And you literally order matters. You can get, 
in the same order, you can have a worse experience. Um, a good analogy here is that for most people, not all, you know, having a real good dinner meal and then dessert after, you really just, oof, you want dinner and then you want dessert. But if you start with dessert and then go to dinner, for a lot of people, by the time they get to, like, when you start with dessert, they're like, ah, this is really sweet. And when they get to the dinner, they're like, I'm not even hungry anymore. And so it's the same thing flipped over sometimes has a pretty different effect. So give that some thought. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Hano Haido, H A N O N N O O O N O N O. Got it. Uh, hi, Docs. I recently came across a workout plan from Chris Jones of the Pump Chasers YouTube channel. What kind of shocked me was the amount of volume he recommended you do in those routines. For every muscle group, he had two workouts in every eight days scheduled. In one of those sessions, he had 24 sets for chest alone, which means 48 sets in a week. It was, the same for all the, <laughs> it was the same for all the other muscle groups as well. It seems to work for him slash his clients too. Any thoughts? So you got to be really careful about what works for people. Um, you, you never get all the reporting. Uh, I'll just throw our own company under the bus. You know, the Renaissance periodization, we have a lot of transformation photos, right? You say, well, the RP stuff seems to work. Like, yeah, or nine out of 10 people that try our shit are like dead or injured or just fat, even fatter. And then we just pick the old, the winners and it's just a huge selection bias and it ends up looking like we're the shit. And I, hopefully we're not doing that. I don't think we are. And I think the RP methods actually work pretty well. But like when people have, when people are famous and they have a lot of followers and they have a lot of success stories, you're not, there's no statistic there that you're seeing of what percent of them actually succeed. And it's easy to, you know, if you have a thousand people doing your program, all you gotta do is take the top 20 that randomly survived the fucking shit program you're writing. And you're like, look at these guys are huge and jacked and they love it. And you're like, oh, it's gonna be me. And you buy the program and it shits you over. So not, not take anything away from Chris Jones of the Pump Chasers. Um, they could very well have really good programs. And a lot of people can actually recover and adapt to 48 sets of chest per week. It's just not all people, right? Which is why James and I are really big on auto-regulation. So start at a low end of volume and progress upwards and see if you get better results with more volume. And if at some point, like you reach 16 sets of chest for each workout every, you know, twice every eight days, uh, and, then, and then going higher seems to just tire you out. You don't get any better results. Well, then, you know, 24 is probably not going to work for you. But for some people, you know, they can really fucking crank it. Is it do, do I consider it roughly... A, relatively unusual if your technique is good, SFR is good for exercise and you're going pretty close to failure to be able to really benefit from 24 sets per session. Uh, yeah, it's probably unusual, but I think maybe the pump chasers folks attract a certain kind of person for whom that really works. And it's good that they're around. It's good that they have a channel to promote a diversity of things because there's other people that like have crazy MRVs and they're just floating around the universe and everyone's telling them, hey, do five through one, three sets, all one, all you need is one set to failure every nine days or some crazy hit shit. And it just never grew. And then they find pump chasers and they go, oh my fucking God, I've got the best gains of my life. So, um, you know, if you really want to try it, try their program. And if it works well for you, you're like, holy shit, I had a huge MRV and I never even knew. But if you're like, ooh, skeptical, try their program, but just cut all the sets in half and see how it works. And if you're like, oh, I can recover from this, no problem. Add some volume slowly. And if you have trouble recovering, then fucking don't. One thing is like, you know, we live in the real world and there's no ideal programs running around, ours included. So you got to like take what you know from various YouTubers and, and, and folks that really know their stuff. Like no, no doubt these folks know a lot of good shit and you got to modify it to what you think is your best guess at what's going on, right? You can't just verbatim take what you want and just be like, well, I'm just going to do the program verbatim. Like you're smart, you're sharp. You're watching this channel, you know some shit. You look at something and you're like, yeah, failure every time. Fuck that. I'm going to go to IR and this much volume. Fuck that. I'll never recover. So uh, I'm just going to adapt the program and all of a sudden the program works really well for you. You know, you know, doing things just verbatim has its uses, but uh, very limited uses. And most of the time you're going to have to rig things a little bit. So Dr. Mike was very nice on that one. So I, I'm going to be the, Here we the, go. the, mean, the James. Yeah, mean James coming out. So yeah, I, I agree with everything Dr. Mike said, but this is one where you'd get the, the skeptical eyebrow. This is actually, a, to me, this is more of a, a Morpheus situation rather than a people's eyebrow, right? So like if I give you the red pill, you have to do 24 sets of chest per session. But what if I gave you a blue pill that got just as good of a stimulus, but only at eight sets per session? What would you think about that? Ooh, ooh, right? ooh, I have an answer, ready? To quote Neo, whoa, whoa. Right, so to me, when somebody is doing that many sets, a couple problems just scream out, right? The first is, are you doing it for the sake of doing that many sets? And if that's the case, totally fine. You're, you're a workhorse, uh, you know, an exercise machine. That's good in its own right. Fine. Um, the other question then becomes like, do you need to do that many sets? And if the answer is yes, like, how are you assessing that? Are you looking at like the, uh, you know, ghetto MEV indicators that we talk about all the time? The next one comes up is like, what's your technique like on all these movements? Because I guarantee, you know, with the reason why we use those like kind of 
uh, I don't remember exactly what we say. I want to say it's, you know, like between five and 10 sets per week, aggregate MAV scores. Um, the reason is, is because that actually works really good when you control for things like technique and mind muscle connection, right? So for me, I would say, so like 24 sets of in one session, right? You could do eight sets three times a week, right? And get it's a good workout. That's fucking, you're getting, you know, more than double the stimulus at that point on a weekly scale, right? So to me, this would scream like a combination of like, are you doing it for its own sake? Have you actually assessed what you need for chest, you know, pick whatever muscle group? Um, what is your technique like on all these movements? And I think once you start whittling down those factors, like, have you even thought about SFR, right? Are you just getting on the like chest machine, like the machine chest press and you're just banging the shit out for as many sets as until you give up on it? Like... I think once you start whittling those factors down, you find that like, oh, I can actually get like a really good chest stimulus from like three sets of deep chest flies. Why would I need to add, you know, 21 more sets after that? Uh, you probably don't. That's probably your MEV for chest. Three, boom, there you go. Um, you know, so uh, I'd be I'd be skeptical if somebody could answer affirmatively on all those points and say like, I have factored all of these things in and uh, this is what I need to do for chest. Because at that point, if you're doing 24 sets per session and you're only training twice a week, I would say like, why aren't you just doing at chest every day at that point? Cause you clearly can recover from it. You know, like, yeah, James, God damn you. That's a really good point. Yeah. If you can recover, if you can survive to have a productive set number 20 through 24 in a workout, right? Like, the same muscle group, yo. you might as well train four or five times a week for that muscle group. And all the literature really says you'll probably get even better gains. So, yeah. And so, Hano, that's just kind of like, you know, I think I, I'm not trying to take away from what Dr. Mike said because I totally agree, but that I would be skeptical of people because I, I don't think that I think those numbers seem somewhat arbitrary and maybe not as well thought out or derived as they could be. So what you might find is you, you start mimicking their program and you get to like set four or five on chest or legs or whatever. And you're like, dude, I'm done. I'm done. There's nothing more to do. And they're like, well, you got 20 more sets. And you're like, ah, you know what? I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it. And I'm going to maybe train chest in a couple of days and see how that goes. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. So Hey now. Hey That's now. Hey now. Don't dream it's over. Hey now. Hey now. Brother. I have no idea what the lyrics to that song are. It doesn't matter. It seems just hey hard. <laughs> All right. Hey now says, hey docs. Or hello docs. How healthy is it for a natural individual with regards to lifespan and general health marks to try to go uh, trying to go through MEV to MRV. Great question. Here's the answer. Uh, not going from MEV to MEV plus is a real bad idea because training fundamentally extends your lifespan and it really extends your quality of life. And occasionally providing a pretty tough stimulus is probably really good for you too. There's a lot of literature, especially in cardiovascular research, that shows that those kind of health markers that are boosted from hard cardio are different than the ones that are boosted even from lots of easy cardio, and there's some big health benefits there. So if you're crushing MRV all the time and overtrained all the time and overreach all the time, it's not good for your longevity. It's not terrible for it, but it's, you know, general health is not that great. Um, if you occasionally challenge your body uh, by going through MEV to MRV, then you're probably doing yourself the best health service you can in, in many respects with training. And if you're not training MEV to MRV, then you almost certainly won't have as good of health as you could and maybe not even as high of longevity. Uh, the longevity question is a bit complicated because sometimes when you train really hard, it increases your quality of life. It slightly decreases your longevity. Uh, technically speaking, to live the longest, you have to do minimal amount of physical activity, eat a minimal amount, stress almost not at all, and sit more or less in meditation your whole life. Yeah, I'm not sure if you know, people want to live like that. I sure as hell don't. So um, as far as quality of life and, and being able to live a nice long life, hard training is a big part of the picture. So yeah, um, absolutely no, nothing to be like, hey, don't go to MRV, you're going to die soon. Fuck, that's, that's total bullshit. Yeah, I agree. So it, to me, it seems like if you are someone who is a non-exerciser and you take this idea of training from MEV to MRV all the way up to 
someone who is like an intermediate exerciser or we'll say intermediate athlete, you could, you could even apply this idea to different sports, not just weights. Um, that seems to be a net benefit overall, but there are more significant trade-offs as you get into more and more advanced athletic endeavors, whether that's bodybuilding or other forms of sport. Like if you want to be a top level rugby guy and play on the international stage, yeah, that's probably going to shave a few years off of your life. And you might actually be a little bit crippled at the end. That's just a trade-off that you have to make for high level of sport in many cases. But I think for most most people going from, you know, non-exerciser or non-athlete to intermediate level, which is like five years of training and, you know, not the hardest training that you'll ever experience. Um, that's just a net positive for, I think, in almost every case The the big trade-offs is when, you know, for somebody like Dr. Mike, like he's carrying a lot of muscle mass, a lot of weight around, like that's, there's def definitely consequences as a result of doing that, but that's the trade-offs he's willing to make and to participate in high levels of sport competition. So that's just, just something that everybody has to assess for themselves. Um. That's our last question. Oh, that was pretty good. Those were some good yeah. ones. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, a couple updates. So uh, Hypertrophy Audiobook is out, folks. You can enjoy that. Uh, you can get the link on our website. Um, yeah, so if, you do, if you're too lazy to read like I am, there you go. You get to listen to my voice all the way through. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a I bug on my microphone. really good. Thanks. Uh, so we converted my um, my uh, downstairs into like a big sound dungeon and the quality came out like surprisingly good, even better than oh, yeah. the last couple ones that we did. So I was really happy with that. Um, other updates for me. Uh, let's see. My book is in the editing stage. So it's uh, in the hands of Dr. Davis. I'm working on like piddly stuff like figures and references and stuff like that right now. So it's that's moving, but not uh, not quite there yet. Mike, you got anything? Just super top secret stuff for now, but we're always trying to get out more YouTube videos. So keep on keeping on, folks. And remember to upvote, upvote the questions you want answered. So when you ask your own question, maybe to look at three or four other questions that you really like and upvote them. Because a lot of times we're getting like the funny jokes upvoted, which is super sweet. Um, but then we have to search really hard and we don't really know which questions you guys really want answered. So, cause you know, there's no guarantee your question is gonna get answered. You could get zero upvotes. So at least make your own question if you're gonna, and then upvote the questions you really want answered. So that way, when you, we get to the next webinar, cause you know, we just look at the comments and that's how we get all the questions going. Um, then we can have uh, more of the questions you want answered. Cause it's like, look, if a bunch of the upvotes are like one and two and zero, we're just gonna start doing zero upvote questions. And people are like, oh, why are they spending an hour talking about this guy's bullshit? Like, well, if you guys, See some questions are like, ooh, I'm curious about that. I'll both them shits and we'll have a better time. Absolutely. All right, folks, we're going to wrap this one up. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks for another Q&A with a new thumbnail. We're back. No more. Woo. All right, folks, thanks again. We'll see you next time. <laughs>